is good morning, it's good afternoon, it's good evening. No matter where you are around the world, you are on Mental Health Mondays Connected. I'm your host or co-host, Gary Goulet, better known as a Gooch, and I got my host for today, Chuck Basti. How you doing, buddy? Oh, man, I'm over the moon today because we have HG Tutor on the show today. Uh, he's in Europe, so this explains the early Mental Health Monday time that we have so i want to thank you for joining us early today at 10 o'clock eastern standard time so we can facilitate a fantastic guest for you it is uh, incredible i did some research after you telling us uh, hg was coming on this is a special time uh we work all night getting up early for us was a little bit more difficult it's not really that early it's only 10 o'clock this has been brought to you by the gooch live production team all right chuck no further ado I want to listen. I'm going to sit back and enjoy an amazing guest. You brought many on, uh, but I'll tell you what, this one is very intriguing and excited uh, to listen. Yeah, and I'm really excited to have HG Tutor on. Uh, he's a psychopathic narcissist, clinically diagnosed and self-admitted. Uh, and if you've ever dealt with a narcissist, it's it's uh, like a, depending on your empathic level, um, of humanity. It's, it's a very challenging, very frustrating, very exhausting experience. So for the people here who don't know what a narcissist is or don't know what an empath is, we're going to go with uh, you step by step through this. HD is a fantastic fountain of, of knowledge. He has literally over 800 videos on YouTube. He's written over 50 books. He is the world's most uh, premier source of narcissism. If you've heard of narcissism before, you've probably heard from a clinical psychologist or a psychotherapist. Uh, we're fortunate enough today to have a uh, uh, an ultra narcissist on the show that's going to be able to tell us the red flags, uh, show us the indications, behavioral patterns, and pathology of narcissism as a disorder. So that way you can free yourself from the narcissistic relationship that you're in right now, or recognize them before they actually come to fruition. So uh, I'm really excited to have you. This is exciting. I have experienced a narcissist. So I'm really excited to listen to HG to understand my thinking about it because I didn't understand. I still don't understand it. So I'm really excited. Ladies and gentlemen, HG Tutor. HG, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, I can see your, your voice blocks vibrating there too. So <laughs> I want to start by thanking you for, yeah, thank you yep. for, uh, for joining us on Mental Health Monday today. I know you're in Europe and, um, you know, this is obviously a, a real special treat for us because uh, I've been trying to, um, I've been watching your content for a couple of years now uh, and putting this interview together has been probably a fruition of two years or so. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I wanted to introduce you and edify you properly, uh, but I figured well, what better way to do that than have a narcissist introduce themselves. So I thought maybe we could just start with you. Um, giving us a, an indication of how you became aware of your narcissism, uh, what the disorder was and how you sought treatment and brought it to where you are today. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me onto the show today. Pleasure to be here. Um, HG Tudor isn't my real name, it's a pseudonym. And also right, you can't see me because I need to protect my identity because the disclosures that I make would have an adverse effect on what I do professionally. And of course, that would threaten my control. And that's one of the central tenets of what I require over people, control. I have always known for as long as I can remember that I was set apart from people, that I was different, that I was superior. I also realized that I viewed people in a different way. And I first realized that primarily as a consequence of the differences that I noticed between the way that my siblings behaved and the way that I did. The things that they experienced, the things that they talked about, the way that they regarded things seemed alien to me. And at times they would laugh at my responses because I would ask them about certain things and they would almost find it curious that I was raising such questions. And as time went on, I realized that the things that affected them didn't affect me. and. I also recognized that there were certain that I found it enjoyable for want of a better description to manipulate people to cause them to be set against one another to cause people to have adverse outcomes the idea of moving people around like chess pieces on a board and then I got older and I continued to do that 
and saw the power that was wielded as a consequence of that and the absence of certain feelings that I had for individuals. And so I continued on my merry way, becoming older and going about what I needed to do. I didn't know what I was, save that I knew that I was different from these other people, that I didn't feel in the way that they did, that I didn't get upset about things in the way that they did, that I wasn't frightened of things in the way that they were, that I didn't like to be touched, for instance. And so I recognized this range of behaviors, but I was fully aware of knowing that I wanted to cause certain outcomes. And one of my earliest memories of that, because my mother is a narcissist, is seeing the way that people looked at her and the, people, the way that people responded to her, that they would kowtow to her, that they would uh, genuflect and bend and become elbow people and kissing the pinky ring, et cetera. And I then thought, I want people to be able to respond to me in that way. That's power. I want that. And at the time, I thought that was perhaps the first realization of what I was. But I've since realized that that was just a way that my narcissism was operating to want to grasp that power. It wasn't until a number of years later when I had finished university that one of my then girlfriends, who was a psychology graduate, said to me that she said, believed that I was both narcissist and psychopath. I found that rather interesting and invited her to tell me more. And as she spoke to me, there were a number of things that she said that resonated with me. Of course, I knew better than to accept that she was right because that would be transferring power to her and one must never do that. And instead, I told her that's all very interesting. Thank you for your input and left it at that. I then went away and read more about what she'd suggested and then realized I have a name for what I am. And so she gave me, if you will, a sort of informal diagnosis. And then as a consequence of certain needs that I have and familial influences uh, in order to try and achieve things that they wanted, I um, agreed to undergo a formal diagnosis, which confirmed that I had narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. It came of no surprise, and I was perfectly content to do that because I wanted to know more about myself and for it to confirm what I already knew and to have it relayed to me. I also found it entertaining. It gave me another opportunity to learn because with an individual such as I, by exposing me to the provision of uh, those working in the mental health field, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, etc., the therapists, all you're going to do is make me better at what I am. You are throwing literally more fuel on the fire. You're allowing me to unlock more of my potential and to gain an understanding. One doesn't go into that with any desire to alter because I have no need to alter. One goes in it with a view to becoming further weaponized, and that's what I've used it for. So that's how my awareness progressed. I want to thank you for your honesty because that's that's mind blowing. I don't think there's a lot of people that have that self awareness that can really admit, you know, what you've just admitted as well. Um, no. I'm not sure. It's, if that's you, the it's easy for me to admit that to you because you don't know who I am, and I would never admit any of those things in my private life to anybody. Fair point. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to start with the narcissism itself because obviously yeah. that's the underlying current, the underlying condition. Um, there's obviously uh, two factors, I think, in narcissism that we can all agree on. Is the first is, number one, is control. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, that's the primary source of what a narcissist does. Um, in, I want to call it a coping mechanism, but I wanted to ask you first before we started, is narcissism uh, a wounded child coping mechanism to enable you to survive in a world lacking empathy? In a way, that's one way of looking at it. Um, the narcissist needs four things. Control, fuel. Fuel is what I describe as the emotional output of another person occasioned by what we do. We need character traits and residual benefits. And residual benefits covers anything from money, pleasure from sex, networking opportunities, facade management, and so forth. Now, Control and fuel are the most important aspects. Why do we need that control? Well, we were created in the cru crucible of having a genetic predisposition towards narcissism allied with a lack of control environment. So 
think of it, if you will, like a cake. You have the ingredients and it has to go in the oven for a particular t period of time at a particular heat. Put those things together, lo, a narcissist is created. If you don't have the ingredients, but you have the lack of control environment, no narcissist. If you have the ingredients, but, no, but you don't have the lack of control environment for the sustained appropriate period of time, no narcissist. Have those two things, you have the narcissist. And because we are created from a lack of control environment allied with the genetic predisposition, we are hypersensitive to the issue of control. So when we are an adult, we pick up on threats to our control. So in the same way that a dog hears frequencies that you and I cannot chirp, I am hypersensitive to what I perceive through my lens of threats to my control. You wouldn't see it the same way. And I know that it's a threat to my control because of my awareness. An unaware narcissist, which makes most of the, um, most narcissists are unaware, they similarly have an instinctive need to assert control, but they don't realize that's what it is. And it's masked as something else. So we all have that intrinsic need for control. What does that manifest like? Well, for example, if you say to me, HG, where the hell have you been? You were meant to be here 15 minutes ago for this interview. Why have you only just turned up now? You're telling me that I've done something wrong and you're trying to pin accountability on me. That threatens my sense of control. It doesn't matter the fact that I am actually later than I said I would be. That's irrelevant from my perspective. You are trying to pin me with accountability and my narcissism will cause me to resist that. If I shouted, Hello, Chuck, as you're walking down the road and you ignored me, you threatened my control. If you say that the cake I've made you doesn't taste very good, you threaten my control. If you're breastfeeding a child and not talking to me, you threaten my control. And so there are repeated instances whereby the victim and victims will frequently and habitually threaten our control inadvertently and not realize they're doing so. So people who are listening, when they suddenly think, this person, he just completely blew up at me lost his temper and raged at me, and I don't even know what I did wrong, you will have threatened the narcissist's control but not realized in the manner that you did it. Um, we're going to get into the archetypes of the narcissist and obviously, you know, the lessers, the mid-ranges, um, the, the, the graders, and the ultras as well before we go. But before we get to that point, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the threatening of the control for the narcissist. So yeah. if you're on the exchange, if I'm the empath and you're the narcissist, um, is it is it a hypocritical view that the narcissist doesn't reciprocate on that control factor? I'll give you an example. So if uh, I threaten your control, if you did the exact same thing to me and I brought that up to you, is that threatening your control yet again? Do you not correct. see that you don't reciprocate on the on the control? You're correct. So <clears throat> you mentioned there about the categorization of narcissists uh, using my lexicon to enable people to understand. I divide them into schools, lesser, mid-range, greater, and ultra. And there are sub-schools within lesser, mid-range, and greater. Lesser narcissists have no awareness. And indeed, if you were to say to the lesser narcissist, you have just done X, so you, you demonstrate the bad behavior that he's engaged in, which was him asserting control, he can't see it. He'll just go, what are you talking about? He's blinded to it. If you say that to the mid-range narcissist, the mid-range narcissist knows that they've done something that you regard as wrong, but there's always a but. There is a justification, a reason, or an excuse. So let's take, for example, you point out to the narcissist, why are you ignoring me? You're giving me a silent treatment. You're not talking to me. The lesser narcissists go, what are you talking about? They'll just point blank deny it because they don't see that they've done it they are that blinded to their behavior. The mid-range narcissist will go, well, yes, I'm not speaking to you because Chuck, you've been nagging me incessantly all morning and I need to focus on this work. Uh, I just can't deal with you in a minute. Now, you may have been nagging, but for a very good reason, but the narcissist rejects your very good reason and edits the version instinctively. So you get the half truth or you might not have nagged at all but the narcissist's narcissism tells him that you've been nagging and rewrites that history. So he knows that he's not talking to you, but in his world, there is a justification. With the greater and ultra, we know that we're not talking to you 
and we know that we're doing it purposely and deliberately to assert control, but we simply don't care. And we know that you regard it as wrong, but that's too bad because the ends justifies the means. Um, I, I want to get into the empathy side because obviously I mentioned before is control. Uh, second is, uh, is lacking empathy. Uh, yes. I was incorrect. I think that I, I, I was in the assumption before I came into your content that all narcissists were unaware. Uh, and after going through hours, tens of hours, 50 hours of your, of your content, uh, I find it brilliant that you've compartmentalized uh, so that we can better understand the levels of narcissism. Otherwise, you're talking about that guy's an athlete, but what does he play? Does he play hockey? Does he play football? Does he yeah. play baseball? You know, rounders, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it, it makes it a little easier, like you said, in the lessers, where you can see that they're completely unaware and yeah. the response you're going to get back from the lesser is, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, and, and for us as empaths, you know, when we hear that, we feel like I'm taking crazy pills. What do you mean? What do I mean? Like you yeah. can't see what you have just done yeah. uh, and you're oblivious to that. And that makes us feel like, well, I, I think either you're lying to us um, mm -hmm. or I'm crazy. And, you know, this is where even the gaslighting gets involved as well. But I want right. to stick on the empathy side first as well. So, the classification is that you don't have empathy and you and I spoke a little bit before this, before the show about this. Can you explain to the empaths? Because I find that most people who have written questions for me tonight, that's the number one underlying question they've had is they don't understand how a narcissist does not have empathy. They don't understand how you don't experience joy, happiness, love, adulation, uh, and sadness, any of these, you know, criteria that you speak about in your videos, which we are going to list in the box below, uh, to follow all those. So you can get all the information from HD tutor. Uh, but can you just speak a little bit to why, uh, we don't understand you don't have empathy and how that impacts your relationship with empaths. Empathic people may struggle to understand that we have no emotional empathy because in part, you want to believe that everybody has it. Yes. And it offends your own empathy to believe that somebody else doesn't have any emotional empathy. Yes. And people, and it's interesting where you mentioned, Chuck, about people saying, I can't comprehend how that person doesn't have any, but we weren't created with any. Would you, for instance, go up to somebody who had no legs, who was born with no legs and say to them, I can't understand how you haven't got any legs. You wouldn't. That would sound ridiculous, yeah. It would, but they're born without legs. We were born, created, without empathy. It's the same thing. We just didn't have it. It wasn't created in us. We didn't have the capability because of the genetic predisposition and the lack of control environment. You're not born uh, immediately with empathy. You have the capacity for it, and it develops. We didn't have that, so it never came about. So in the same way, Let's say, for example, you were born and the various uh, cones in your eyes meant you can't see red. Mm -hmm. You don't have the capacity to see red and you never will, save perhaps if there was some kind of um, bionic almost adjustment that could be made. But you're not going to you're not going to grow cones that suddenly allow you to see red. You're born. You are created without them. We are created without emotional empathy because it serves no purpose for us. You see the world through a lens of emotional empathy. Your coping mechanism, and you refer to it being that way, and it's entirely accurate to describe it as such, your coping mechanisms in this world are revolving around sharing, cooperation, taking other people into consideration, do to others as you'd like them to do unto you. Now, I understand those concepts as a matter of intellectual concepts, but I don't feel them. I don't feel there's nothing inside me that compels me to feel that I should behave in that manner. It's an intellectual response to it. My lens, so you see the world through a lens of emotional empathy. I see the world through a lens of control. And it's a very simple lens. You're either giving it me or you're threatening it. And if you're giving me that control, all is well. You are now painted white. If I see through your behavior, all your behavior in your interaction with me is channeled, funneled through that lens, not through a lens of emotional empathy, because it just doesn't exist. We do not have it. Some of our kind, such as myself, we have cognitive false empathy. We have yes. worked out what to do. 
So our narcissism realizes, oh, so let's say, for example, you and I are walking along the road and a little old lady falls down. You would feel inside of you, oh dear, she's hurt. I'll go and help her. In fact, you wouldn't even think about it. You just go and do it. You would instinctively react that way. I would see her and I would feel nothing, perhaps other than say contempt, because there's a weak individual that's fallen over. But dependent on the circumstances, my narcissism would either say, here is an opportunity for you to assert control. Let's say I'm walking along uh, with you for me to look good in front of you. And I say, hey, Chuck, let's go and help this little old lady. I'm not doing that because I've got emotional empathy. I'm doing it because it makes me look good in front of you. I am controlling you by triangulating you with my assistance for the little old lady. And then later that night, I go to a dinner party and I say, hey, on the way over, I was taking a walk with uh, Chuck and this little old lady fell in the road and we helped her and we got her off to the emergency room. And everybody goes, oh, HG, aren't you a good chap? Uh, bravo. I didn't do it because I care. I did it because it helped me control other people. I triangulated those people at the dinner party with the earlier event. So you operate from a, from a position of feeling. I operate from a position of uh, an almost academic intellectual appraisal of the situation and in an aware fashion determine what's in this for me. Shall I just walk over the lady because there's nothing to be gained here? In fact, she'll slow me down getting to where I need and I will if necessary. Or do I help her? Not because I care, but because it serves my purposes to control, to gain fuel, character traits and residual benefits and emotional empathy means the narcissist does not love many narcissists think that they do but they haven't got that about them we don't care we have no compassion there's no honesty there's no decency all of those empathic traits are missing and of course it seems entirely abhorrent to an empathic person think that's awful how can you live like that well from my point of view I see people have emotional empathy getting themselves in all manner of difficulties, getting upset, curled up in a ball, crying over the loss of a relationship. I regard that as a hindrance and pathetic, but I realize that's my perspective and people don't necessarily agree with it. We are created without that emotional empathy. Many narcissists don't realize that. Those of us that are aware do realize that. It is just the way that we are. We have been created differently. You have a, a fantastic video, the three strands of, of, of empathy, and I'm going to include the mm -hmm. videos I'm talking about referencing for our guests to, to watch, because I really want to encourage uh, our guests to really get into this uh, content because it's it's not only is it incredibly helpful, it's it, it, it's understanding this. And empaths, generally speaking, have to understand a situation, mm -hmm. like you said, from our from our lens of empathy, we have to understand so that way we can give compassion, so that way we can give you space uh, in, in understanding something that is foreign to us or alien to us. Uh, but you mentioned cognitive empathy, which is really, I would say that I've been working with narcissistic people for about five years in my personal mm -hmm. life. Uh, and this just came about about six months ago for me. So you call it cognitive empathy. I called it manufactured empathy. Uh, it's exactly the same concept, but yeah. it was uh, like, give you an example. So I've got a narcissistic friend of mine uh, down in the Caribbean, and I spent about five years housing him got back and forth with him. Um, I, I always thought he was a narcissist, but I always stopped short of fully making him having MPD because he demonstrated empathy in certain instances. Now, there were times where uh, there was a disconnect in me that I ignored because I wanted to see the good in people, the empath in me. Um, and I ignored that at uh, the red flag, which was there, knowing what I know now, I could see that. Uh, but it was cognitive empathy, what you described as calculated, manipulative, you know, to serve his purpose. So that way he can look good or he can actually um, gain in the situation. But it wasn't something that was uh, instinctive to him. And he didn't do it because it was the right thing to do or because he felt it was the right thing. Like you said, he did it because there was a benefit to him as well. Uh, and then when I brought that up to him, um, everything about being a narcissist to him was, you know, more or less on the lesser side. So mm -hmm. I don't know. He's the most intelligent human being I will ever meet in my entire life, unless I meet you, uh, because you're highly aware. He's not really aware. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's very traumatized uh, and he's had a lot of PTSD. Combining that with the narcissism, uh, but the cognitive empathy is, is the most dangerous side for, I think, as us as empaths because we believe that to be true empathy and yeah. versus accepting that you are a narcissist or you have those narcissistic capabilities 
yes. that we give you a pass on because we believe that the cognitive empathy is real empathy. Can you just speak to that for a second? Well, that's indeed the case, and that's what misleads people. But in order, of course, to bring people into control and utilize them, because you are all appliances to us, you are little more than toasters, TV sets, and refrigerators that serve a function for us. So in order to bring you under control, if I went into a bar and sat next to a beautiful lady and said, hello, my name's H.G. Tudor, I'm a narcissistic psychopath, and I'm going to abuse you, chances are she'd throw her dirty bikini <laughs> over me, scream and run away. So I've immediately lost control of her. So that would be a basic error, a schoolboy error to make. So I wouldn't do it. So what I do is I create the impression that I'm kind and interesting, and of course I'm well-dressed and I'm a handsome chap and I smell good and I'm witty and I'm humorous and I'm urbane, and I draw her in. And I exhibit compassion when she talks about something sad because my narcissism instructs me to respond in that way. It causes me to adjust my facial features in a practiced manner to convey concern. I know how to do that, but I don't feel anything on the inside. I would most likely be thinking, this is all rather dull, but not to worry. I'm getting her under control, so it then justify the means. And many people, they wonder, well, how can I tell? How am I able to recognize that I'm dealing with that? And it's actually a very simple litmus test that all people should use. And it goes like this. Many people experience the cognitive dissonance where they think, I was with this person and they were really <laughs> lovely and kind and fun and interesting. And he loved me. She loved me. We had, they did all of these things with me. And, they, and then all of a sudden it went horribly wrong. And they started to ignore me and they cheated on me and they insulted me and they compared me unfavorably to other people. I don't understand. Where did the love go? Where did all of that compassion go? How did it go wrong? The answer is it was never there in the first place. Yes. People make people make the mistake of thinking it was there and then it went. It wasn't. We are not part-time narcissists. And anybody who repeatedly <laughs> and systematically abuses you, did, what they showed you to begin with was a fabrication with no emotional empathy. I have a video, the narcissist double abuse, where I talk about how we abuse you twice. We abuse you in the beginning when we're pleasant to you. It's entirely false. We are, that is not genuine. And then we abuse you in the, in the traditional way, if you will, of being nasty to you. And so if you have an individual who is repeatedly ignoring you, cheating on you, physically assaulting you, belittling you, not providing you with emotional support or help with domestic chores, taking your money. If this goes on over a, a period of time and is an habitual behavior, you are most likely dealing with a narcissist. And it isn't that something's gone wrong. It's merely what you saw in the beginning wasn't genuine. So don't think that, oh, they are capable of being really kind. No, we are capable of making you believe that we are kind. But we are that's, not. That's a great point. Because, I mean, every single person that I deal with that has dealt with a narcissist has that exact HD to the to the word. They say, he was so nice to me for three uh, three months, or she was so yeah. nice for three months, and then the wheels fell off, something happened, he had a bad day. And I'm like, no, it was never there. That's like Santa Claus. That's like the Easter Bunny. It never exactly. happened in the first place. It was an actor giving you a brilliant show of love bombing of how that looks. Right. And right. they refuse to believe that. And somebody once told me that uh, in the absence of truth, um, people will take any sort of falsity that agrees with what they want that person to be, as yeah. opposed yeah. to accepting that person who they really are and believing them and say, thank you for showing me who you really are. I'm now moving on and you go on. But we have this kerfuffle as empaths to try and either convert you, change mm -hmm. you, uh, mm -hmm. fix you is a good one. You know, exactly. to, to get into that narrative, um, but um, you had some, you had, you've broken this down, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but okay. it's just so valuable that it would be, I would be a remiss if I if I didn't mention this. Can you quickly just go through uh, the lessers, uh, the mm -hmm. mid ranges, and the subcategories, so that way people can understand what type of narcissist they're dealing with? Because, like, what I've learned from you is that you know I, I'm never going to use the word that person's a narcissist anymore because it's just not accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a matter of what kind or That's what right. type of what archetype of narcissist are you dealing with? Because that will be more effective in being able to have a more effective conversation or facilitating whatever relationship you need to have with that person. So if you could break it down 
from the lessers, the mid ranges, the, mm -hmm. the graders, and the ultras, and have okay. us understand that side. I, I think that would be great. Okay. Well, naturally, it's a huge topic to go through everything. So I'm going to give you some bite sized chunks. What I would yeah. say is you like, um, there is my YouTube channel, which is an encyclopedic uh, resource which gives you lots of more information about these various schools and subschools that I'm going to tell you about. I also provide a service called the NARC detector, which you'll find in the menu bar at my blog, narcsite.com. That's N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E.com. And that's where you provide me with the information and I analyze it using my objective expertise to tell you, A, are you dealing with a narcissist or not? And if so, why? And if you are, which school and which cadre you're dealing with and that's invaluable because it enables you then to use that information to realize this is what I'm dealing with and then you can fine-tune your reading and listening to focus in on the relevant sub school so I'd encourage people to utilize that if they've got any concerns that they might be dealing with a narcissist and there's plenty of testimonials that tell you about how effective that is world-class testimonials everybody is five stars in the reviews well done on that because I, I went to that site and it, there's this like just countless reviews that are all five stars and just genuine. You can tell these are empaths writing these reviews. You couldn't make that up yeah. because they, they speak empathic. They're so grateful for that insight. It's like the world has been lifted off their shoulders in the right. reviews alone. And I apologize for interrupting you, but I want to kind of get uh, your view there. Quite all right. So <clears throat> with the lessers, there's lower lesser, middle lesser, upper lesser A and upper lesser B. The common theme that lessers have is no empathy whatsoever. No emotional empathy, no cognitive empathy. They, lower lesser, middle lesser generally have a low cognitive function. Upper lesser A and upper lesser B can also have a low cognitive function, but in some instances they can actually be rather clever. They have a fairly narrow manipulative palate, often involving the application of heated fury, verbal violence, physical violence, sexual violence. They have no awareness as to what they are, and invariably you point out their behavior, you'd be met with a blank look and a shrug. Your lower lesser is your out and out loser, your wife beating, trailer trash, uh, moonshine drinking, rotten toothed asshole who is thick as mince, physically violent, doesn't really work or intermittently and everything naturally revolves around him. Middle lesser, more likely to work, and he has a touch of the mid-range narcissist about him. So you'll have some slightly passive aggressive behaviors there. Your upper lesser type A is quite an energetic, energetic individual. And a good way of likening to them is they tend to be pretty charismatic and they're often perhaps a really good friend, but you know that this friend repeatedly cheats on his wife, but you still can't help but like him. And he's the, they're the type of people that turn up at a party and they go, woohoo, beer, women, gear, let's get it on. Three hours later, they've gone, everyone goes, who was that guy? Like, no idea. And he came in like a, a tornado, picked everything up, whirled it all around, and thought, wow, this is exciting, and he's gone. And people just kind of, you don't necessarily feel too badly treated by that individual. But if you were to go to him and say, oh dear, oh dear, my wife has left me, it's awful. He'd go, fantastic, we can go to the strippers then, can't we? To the bars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get into the bar. So he has, he, he can't see it, he can't read the situation. Often upper lesser type A's are quite involved in sort of cult situations, that they create a cult because they are this energy and they, they are charismatic. You're upper lesser type B. So I call upper lesser type A the affable assholes. That's one way of remembering them, okay? Upper lesser type B are belligerent, bullying, boasting, bragging individuals. I'm big, you're small. I'm the best, you're useless. I'm tough, you're weak. Listen to me, my way or the highway. Don't like it, F you. Don't want to stay in my business, get out of town. And upper lesser type Bs are often successful, but usually at a local level, though we did have a very good example of one who got to the highest office in the land of the United States just recently. I'll let you guess who that was. So, yeah. um, and they're very much, it, what you see is what you get. And of course can be hugely effective because there is a place for saying, you're wrong, get out. This is how it is. So the lessers are grouped with those four subschools, and that's a little taste. And if you want to learn more about them, I have a series in my knowledge vault called HG Malls. And I go through these various subschools and take them to task, giving you highlighting of the various characteristics and behaviors. Mid-range narcissists, these tend to be the most difficult ones to spot. 
There's lower mid-range, middle middle range A, middle middle range B, and upper mid-range. These individuals have cognitive empathy. They tend to think that they're good people. Indeed, middle middle range A and B often think that they're empaths. And the lower mid-ranger has an intermittent facade. So to many people, he's the decent guy, but every so often you see it slip and you think, yeah, I wouldn't get on the wrong side of him. But generally speaking, he's okay. But of course, behind closed doors, he's violent to his wife. The lower mid-ranger can have explosive temper, but, and, but has a greater level of control on ignited fury compared to all of the lessers. Middle mid-range A and B, these are your hugely passive aggressive, why is everybody picking on me? Why is the world against me? I, and middle mid-range A, they are the helicoptering parents, the interfering relatives who think that, oh, but I'm only trying to help. I'm only, and they tell you how to live your life. And they think that they're good people, but they're not. Again, they have cognitive empathy. They have a moderate threshold on their ignited fury. They can be reasonably charismatic. They can be of decent intelligence. Middle mid-range type B are the crybabies. They turn on the waterworks, huge pity plays. All mid-rangers can use silent treatments, uh, pity plays, but they use it the most. Upper mid-range, haughty, arrogant, but often something behind it. So these people are often achievers. So you might get a surgeon in a hospital and everybody goes, oh, he's a completely cocky bastard but he is really good at what he does. So people kind of miss it because they think there's something behind it. Again, mid-rangers, they are unaware, but they recognize that their behaviors might be viewed as problematic, but it's never their fault. So they, they are huge blame shifters. So when you say they're unaware, uh, if yeah. you actually approach a lesser or a mid-range narcissist, like your, your girlfriend in college did for you and actually gave you, hey, I think you're a narcissist, What's the reaction, the common reaction for that? Well, a lesser narcissist would go, what's a, na what's a narcissist then? He wouldn't, he'd wouldn't. he have no idea because he'd just be so thick, you know. Um, so he just rejected out of hand, what's one of those? Or get out of here. He, he'd probably just say something like, don't be using those dictionary words around me and, and walk yeah. off. Big words. So the, nar the narcissist basically says, I am not even going to let this individual comprehend that. Okay? With a mid-ranger... They would reject it and they they might do say something like that's a load of nonsense actually because you're the narcissist and you're projecting onto me ah, yeah? yeah so often mid-range narcissists will read about narcissism and because of their own lens they think the true victim is the narcissist and they think they are the victim because yeah. their narcissism betrays it that way and so they will often call other people narcissists and sometimes they'll be right about it, but they can't see it in themselves. So you might have a situation where husband and wife go out for dinner with another husband and wife, and let's say the first husband is the narcissist, and he says to his wife in the taxi home, have you noticed the way that Hank is always putting down his wife? Little little, little snipes and asides at her. Yes. And the wife turns to him and goes, you do that to me. And he, and he immediately goes, no, I don't. He, can't, he won't be able to see it. Or he'll say, yeah, but that's only because... Sometimes I need to correct you. I, it's your fault that I behave that way. Yeah, sure. The great narcissists, they have awareness. They know what they are, hugely charismatic, have a high threshold on ignited fury, and invariably hold positions uh, high up in politics, high up in industry, often um, very famous entertainers and artists. They know what they are, but they won't go around admitting it because that would be a transference of power. And these individuals create the impression of often being very benevolent individuals who honestly do care about the state of the nation, but they have such a brilliant facade, which is a combination of apparent compassion allied with their super innate superiority, invariably intelligent individuals that have extensive uh, networks, extensive reach, uh, are Machiavellian in terms of because greater narcissists are calculated. They know what they are. They'll have some instinctive responses, but a lot of what they do is calculation. Lesser and mid-range narcissists, it's all about instinct. And then there's the ultra, which is me, top of the pile. <laughs> and that's because of my height and level of self-awareness. Which is world-class. Like, I have to give you your due on this one because um, I, I, I don't even know how to place you. Because, like, your self-awareness 
for uh, a non-neurotypical person would be like almost autistic. You have this yeah. fantastic memory recall um, of, of just pure honesty of, I've never met a person or talked to the person who is more objective than you are when you're speaking about yourself. It's, it's, it's almost like you are two different people. One is, I call mine the good Chucky doll and the bad Chucky doll, like in the Flintstones, yeah. um, where you have the good Fred and the bad Fred. And it's like, you have both, but they actually are best friends with each other. Uh, so that way it actually coexists and allows you to have a little bit more peace of mind or less torment in your life than a lesser or mid-range narcissist, which you know struggles with the exhausting way of being, of being a narcissist. Well, with lesser and mid-range narcissists, they don't actually find it exhausting. But what might happen is their narcissism will claim that they find their life exhausting as a pity play. So what will happen is a mid-range narcissist will go, my life's so difficult, uh, it's exhausting being me. He doesn't genuinely mean that. What his narcissism has done is says, you're allowed to say that as a pity play to assert control over the listener and draw fuel from them. And although their lives, of course, can be very chaotic because their narcissism works in the moment in terms of asserting control and drawing fuel now and now and now and now. For me and the graders, we look ahead. So lesser and mid-range narcissists suffer collateral consequences. So their, their narcissism is brilliant at achieving what needs to be achieved, the prime aims, but then there'll be a collateral consequence thereafter. So for example, middle lesser, he's at work, third day running as he turns up late, his manager in the warehouse says, this is the third day that you've turned up late, I'm putting you on a disciplinary. That challenges that narcissist's sense of control. He doesn't know this, but his narcissism in the background goes, incoming, threat to control, we must now instruct this narcissist by making him furious so he acts on it and cause him to think that this guy is a jumped up little Hitler in middle management. And so his manipulative palette is pretty limited. So the middle lesser punches him. He's put him on the floor. What has he now got? He's controlled him. The narcissism has worked brilliantly. What happens in the next moment? He's sacked. But the narcissism didn't care about what came next because yeah. in the moment where he is sacked, and somebody says, oh, his friend whispers to him, what did you do that for? You've just lost your job. What will his narcissism do? It'll immediately jump in and go, it's not your fault. And he'll turn, he'll turn around and go, wasn't my fault. He's always been on my case. He's always pick on me, picking on me. He deserved that punch in the face. So although they have sometimes quite chaotic roller coaster lives, they never see that it's their fault. If you were to sit down with a lesser narcissist and get a piece of paper and say, right, Mr. Lesser Narcissist, Here's my name at the top. And I'm going to put everybody in my life that I've fallen out with. There would just be the narcissist name underneath. And then underneath the, <laughs> underneath the narcissist name, you'd have this. Me, your ex-wife, your ex-ex-wife, your, yeah. your son, your daughter, your neighbours, the teachers at the school, your colleagues, your mum, your dad, the man who sells hot dogs on the corner of the street. And if you said to the lesser narcissist, what does that tell you? He would just do this. They're all arseholes. Just dismiss it. Mm -hmm. If you did the same exercise with the mid-range narcissist, he would go through that list one by one. Well, my mother's always been awkward with me. I told you that. My dad's an abuser. My sister, I don't know why she doesn't talk to me. She, there's something wrong with her. The neighbors, they're just really nosy. They've always caused trouble for me. My ex, I told you, she was abusive. And they will go through that list one by one by one and tell you why it's not their fault and it's everybody else's. And they can't see that they're the common denominator. Now, wow. it's hard with the greater because you wouldn't necessarily have such a long list because greater than the ultra, we're more practiced at keeping people on side. But if you were to draw up a list, we would we essentially know, yeah, I know I caused that fallout with them, but I'm now convinced you that it wasn't my fault. Uh, and in some instances, it might even be as, well, they got in the way. And if you get in the way of me, that's what happens to you. That's the way business is business, for example, blood on the boardroom carpet. Uh, I want to get to some questions because I, I have literally 50 mm -hmm. questions that I've had to go through uh, so if we can kind of play rapid fire with these questions, I want to play yes. rapid fire at the end of the show as well to talk about some personalities and get your take on what type of narcissist they are. Uh, okay. but we'll start to try and get some questions. So are you a good narcissist? Is there such a thing as a good narcissist? Uh, the concept of good is a matter of perspective. Uh, for example, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. I do things which people will label as good. 
other people would label some things that I do as bad. It's all a matter of perspective. I do what is good for me. Is a, is a greater narcissist better than a lesser narcissist? Um, well, it depends how you define better, but in broad terms, you would say yes, because a greater narcissist, for example, might create a technology company which creates a new device which makes everybody's life easier. The less is more likely to come along and punch you in the face and rob you of your wallet. <laughs> Fair point. Um, can a lesser mid-range narcissist ever allow themselves to be a greater uh, narcissist or an ultra? No, you, you can't. You can't shift schools. It's fixed. Wow. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about the dual diagnosis of, uh, obviously you were diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Yes. Uh, some people call that sociopathy, uh, as well as MPD as well. But when you are dealing with narcissism, um, I want to stick with cluster Bs because histrionic mm -hmm. borderline, which you have a video on borderline, which was fantastic as well. Can you just speak to the underlying current? Because to me in the cluster Bs, there's an underlying current of narcissism through all of those cluster yes. Bs why aren't they all classified as types or architects like you have of narcissism with fringe benefits well you're entirely correct to make that observation as you've highlighted in my video about the borderline um, those that are diagnosed with borderline uh, section of them are people actually have post-traumatic stress disorder and their behavior is manifest as a consequence of that and the rest of them are actually narcissists but they're not called that but they should be ditto with histrionic they are a different blend of narcissist uh, for example, with a borderline, uh, people say, oh, the difference between a borderline and a narcissist, or one of the differences is the borderline has a threat of abandonment, fears abandonment, the narcissist fears damage to self-esteem. Well, those are two branches on the same tree. Where do they stem from? They're both threat and control. control. Yeah. So if, 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 the, if the borderline, in inverted commas, thinks that you're going to leave him, you're threat he, that threatens his control. And borderlines invariably go, they, they claim to know that their behavior causes problems, just like a mid-range narcissist, but they never ever accept responsibility for it. Because what do they do? It's not me, it's my borderline. It's a very subtle form of blame shifting. So with regard to those particular cluster bees, there is a, there is a compelling argument to say, do it away with them. And either just have one, uh, diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder or do as I do that you have the various schools and subschools within it to help people recognize that these are the overarching central aspects of narcissism and then you get the flavors the differences because there are certain things that we all share we're all manipulative we all have no emotional empathy we all need control character traits residual benefits and fuel so we have all of that in common but then there are variations on a theme some narcissists don't manipulate in a particular way. Some narcissists have uh, awareness, some do not. Some have cognitive empathy, some do not. Some have a moderate, some have a high, some have a very high threshold on ignited fury. Some have a very low threshold, so you have those differences. So yeah, there should be a rethink really there with regard to that section. Well spotted. The question that I got the most, uh, and I mean, uh, I make no uh, bones that I, I think Donald Trump is the absolute worst human being on the face of the planet. Uh, I love your videos, which preface the fact that you have no identity, whether it be left or right, conservative or liberal. Um, you're talking about the disorder of narcissism. So the question is, why is Donald Trump, why is Donald Trump a threat to uh, the world as a lesser mid-range or lesser type B? personality uh, versus an Obama or Joe Biden, who happens to be a much more cognitive narcissist. They're all threats to the world, but in different ways. They're narcissists, which means they come first and everybody else comes second. However, there are instances whereby what can create the impression of people coming first in order to ensure that we come first. Take what I do. I advise empathic victims of narcissists how to get away and stay away. And I lay bare exactly the way that my kind think. So people would say, well, that's a, inverted commas, good thing. Now, I also do some, what people would describe as pretty evil and despicable things. But I am perfectly capable of doing those things, but I only do them because it extends my legacy, which is what it's all about. The difference is with, with Trump compared to say Obama is that Obama has a higher control on his ignited fury. 
So you're not going to see Obama suddenly yell at a reporter and go, fake news. He also operates with calculation. So with Trump, he has an instinctive knee-jerk response, which means that his narcissism could take him to a response which is particularly volatile. But that said again, of course, you have to, you have to recognize that there are many people that I identified with him because his style of narcissism was no nonsense. He called it as it was. Now, if you happen to agree with the way that he calls it, he's great. If you think that he's the most unstatesmanlike POTUS that has existed, of course, his mannerism really grates with you, indeed sickens people. So there are different levels of effectiveness that occur, which are based upon the way that you see the world and how that narcissist fits into that. So some people think, well, he was great because he didn't come from a political dynasty. He wasn't from a technocratic elite. He was a, in inverted commas, successful businessman who called it as it was and he got things done. So they thought, well, that makes sense for me. Of course, the other side of it is that it was, it was, it was the Donald Trump show. It's the, it's the Joe Biden show. It's the Barack Obama show. But those two are better at covering it up than Trump. So Trump's actually an easier target and appears more dangerous. But actually, because he's so obvious that there are ways that can be done to almost steer him in a different direction or at least move things away from him. So think about an errant toddler in your house that's going berserk. You're running around lifting the china out of the way and shifting the glassware so he doesn't barrel into it. Whereas while you're doing that, Obama, who's applied a bit of misdirection, has, has lifted your wallet and has taken, taken your 401k away from you, etc., without you even realizing what he's doing. So there's different levels of danger. And the point is, the narcissist always acts in their own self-interest. Sometimes that will result in the creation of good things for other people, but invariably that's only done if it benefits us. Uh, last question here. So this person has obviously seen a lot of your content. Thank you, Sarah. Um, rock, paper, scissors, what beats an ultra? Nothing beats an ultra. So there's no rock, paper, scissors game. If you're an ultra, nothing beats an ultra. What, well, what would happen is if you were involved with me, you apply no contact as best you can. And dependent on where you fit in my fuel matrix, what would happen is I would continue to assert control over you, but I would get bored after a while. I'd be like a cat playing with a mouse. So as long as you batten down the hatches and ride it out, I'll move on to something else. I might, I might come back but you should run and run as far away as you possibly can. <laughs> okay. We're going to shift to rapid fire here. So um, okay. I, I've taken a list of people here that I, uh, I think are narcissists, uh, okay. depending on what type I'm going to let you take uh, the, the control of this one and name them uh, type of Obama. I beg your pardon. What type you of want, you want me to go through, You want me to go through the type of each one? Yeah, we'll just go. You get the, kind of give your best guess to which each person I'm going to list as a celebrity of what type of narcissist kind of matches them. Okay, well, well he, he's up a greater. Okay. Uh, Trudeau, our prime minister from Canada. Nice hair, swag. Middle greater. Uh, Oprah. She isn't one. Good. All right. Will Smith. He isn't one. Okay, his wife Jada. His wife. Yeah. Um, Jada Pinkett Smith. She is one. What would I say that she is? Probably upper mid range. Okay, Pope Francis. Pope Francis. Would I say that he is one? I would say that he would be middle greater. Um, I'll go Hillary A, Bill B. Hillary, upper mid-range. Bill, upper greater. JFK. Lower greater. Jeff Bezos. Jeff I'm Bezos. really interested in this one, yeah. Um, Probably, I would say, with him, likely to be lower greater. Um, no, middle greater. Okay. Bill Gates. Isn't one. Oh, okay. Um, let's go with the late Steve Jobs. 
Jobs, he is one, and upper mid range. My good friend Christopher Hitchens. God the Hitch. The Hitch. Yes. Love the Hitch. I, I wouldn't say he's one. Wow. Okay, cool. Michael and Jackson. Jackson. What you have to bear in mind is that some of these individuals will be narcissistic, but not narcissists. Yes. Fair point. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Wacko Jacko. Uh, yeah. Middle grater. Uh, Melania. Not one. Right. Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein. Well, clearly he he is, or was rather. Um, upper grater. Upper grater. Okay, good. Yeah. That's uh, honestly that's a uh, that's my fi rapid fire session as well. I mean, you did fabulously well on your on your spot mm -hmm. to to negotiate all that. HG, well done to you. Well done. Um, in closing here, I wanted to kind of give you uh, the last word mm -hmm. of uh, where people can find you. Obviously, I'm going to list all your videos. I love your Why Do I Do This video. Um, so on this link, yeah. we're going to list about 10 different videos, which I've prefaced uh, inside the conversation. Uh, I can't implore you enough if you're suffering at the hands of a narcissist or you need to understand narcissists. Um, you can go with the clinical psychologist side and get a theory of it, or you can go to HG site and get it right from the horse's mouth of, of what the best effective way for you to negotiate your situation with any narcissist. My opinion is run, uh, but if that's not an option, then HG is your best option as well. So uh, I'll leave you the last word. Thank you very much. It's very important to understand narcissism and know that when you're ready to understand it and the resources that I provide give you an unparalleled ability to gain insight and understanding. And I have a huge range of videos, as Chuck has already alluded to, uh, a number of books, which you can find on Amazon. Just search against my name, HG Tudor. If you use my website, narcsite.com, that will tell you uh, there's hundreds of articles there, which are all gratis. I have a knowledge vault, which you'll find over 250 different products, which will tell you various things that you can understand more about. For instance, if you find yourself in a shelf dynamic with a narcissist being picked up and down, I explain to you why that's happening. I explain to you how the intimate relationship pans out with a narcissist so you can understand more. And I provide you with lots of tools that enable you to understand yourselves as well and to defend yourself. There are not detectors and empath detectors. And you also have the option as well of being able to speak to me in person through an audio consultation. So. And I do many, many of those. And you can see the testimonials on my site. We'll tell you all about it. And there you get the bespoke assistance from me. I don't bite. I'm there to help you. And I know some people are a little bit nervous about speaking to me. That's understandable. But just read the testimonials and you'll see the outcomes that people have had. I can help you because I'm not tethered by having to have some kind of license or abide by ethics. I love winning, which means that you will win because your win naturally becomes my win because I acquire it as part of my character trait acquisition. But the point is, if you want to get away from somebody who's abusing you and you want to keep them away from you and keep yourself away from them, if you want to get rid of those thoughts and those feelings associated with that individual, consult with me and I guarantee if you follow what I tell you to do, you will succeed and achieve freedom. So utilize those platforms, my YouTube channel, which... Uh, Chuck has very kindly been displaying in the banner. And there's a Facebook page and my blog. You can access all the free material there, and then you can fine tune it through the Knowledge Vault and the various consultations as well. And that will enable you to achieve the freedom, which ultimately you richly deserve. And we will both get the win. You'll get free, and my legacy will be extended. I think that uh, I would be very interested in people that I know that would go through your content and at the end, um, they would actually have to be able to be sat with the fact that the illusion of who they wanted that person to be for themselves is, is just an illusion and they don't believe that. And it's just about believing the signs and accepting that person is who they are, as opposed to believing the facade or the illusion or the, uh, the, the performance that they've been experiencing uh, and then being able to drop that. Because I find people 
will come up with fantastic reasons of why they want to believe this and just lie to themselves in the face of what you and I can readily see and be like, please, like this guy is going to ruin you. This yep. is a matter of, t of when, not a matter of if, and I can see ahead of the curve, but this is going to destroy you. I, I beg you, please believe that this person is not what you think they are. And I find most people that I deal with uh, are incapable of that. There's a there's a big word I use is incapable or um, or unable. And I Indeed. think most people are uh, yeah. Like the, are you unwilling or are you unable? If you're unwilling, that's that's stubbornness. But yeah. if you're unable and you're codependent and you're trying to fix that person so that way you can feel better about yourself, you might want to get some therapy on that. Indeed, and I will ensure that people are. I often talk about being hit around the face with the frozen cod of logic that will sh shake you from that stupor almost. And I don't pull any punches. I will give you the brutal, honest truth of the way that we behave. It isn't grandiosity. We are not invulnerable, by the way. We hate no contact. If you do no contact to a narcissist, it's like pouring water on the Wicked Witch of the West. We can't stand that. But the point remains, there's a lot of misinformation out there about narcissism that takes people into very dangerous places. I just tell you how it is because I know how it is because I am one. And by listening and applying what I say to you, you will find that you will have a much better outcome. And the number of times I get emails from people saying, HG, were it not for you, I wouldn't be here. HG, were it not for you, I wouldn't have seen my children any longer. Because not only do I advise people with regard to unentangling themselves, disentangling rather, from romantic ensnarements, I assist people with regard to ongoing custody disputes, divorce mm -hmm. situations, and spending the money with me for an hour will save you thousands. I advise people on business disputes as well, um, because the mentality is there that you have a narcissist that's going to try and cause you problems. I know the way that my kind think and I help you navigate that way through it, primarily by looking at no contact first, but in other situations where you have to have some form of ongoing involvement, where it's co-parent or perhaps litigation or a divorce, I will be able to tell you what you need to do to maximize your prospects of success and most importantly of all, the mistakes that you need to avoid because there's lots of pitfalls. So use the resource, that's what it's there for. Yeah, and I and I uh, I have to say that I didn't know if you were going to be an ally or an enemy, uh, an enemy in my mind because you will be every single narcissist I've ever dealt with yep. that I'm pulling my hair out, and as you can see, I've got thick Irish hair. Uh, ally because I've listened to your content for years, yep. and not only did it all just make sense, it was actually emphatically true, mm -hmm. and like to a fault, it's been so true that like you said, if you follow the parameters and you believe what your content states, you'll get yourself out of the situation that will Absolutely. around the corner Absolutely. destroy you. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of, matter of fact. So, people people, often, people we, often say, HG, well, how could we trust you? You're, you're a, you are a diagnosed and, and confirmed and you accept that you're a narcissistic psychopath. Why are you, you could be lying to us. You're right, I could be. Well, just put it to the test. Yeah. Read the yeah. read the testimonials, listen to it, apply it, and you'll see that it works. And the reason why I tell you that truth is because it serves my purpose to tell you that truth. Because that enables me to create the legacy that I talk about. Yeah, and we're gonna include that video at the very start why I do this by HD. Yeah, that would be on, on YouTube as well. It because was, I mean, I think that is me that's also the first thing about it as well. So often people say to me, but I thought, I thought narcissists don't help people, so why are you doing this? And I said, seriously, you're probably watching me on a device that was created by a narcissist. We mentioned him earlier. You may well go and watch, <laughs> you may well go and watch a show that involves a narcissist who's your favorite entertainer. We do good things because they work for us. Not, uh, Of course, that narcissist could be a complete low life when he goes, I mean, as you know, with Jobs, you saw the way that he behaved with regard to his child. Um, with regard to his, the mother of his child, he was, his behavior there was poor, to put it mildly. But what he did do was he created this amazing brand, which is probably in many people's houses. And people 
watching and listening, etc., as we speak now. So the narcissist will do great things. Most fantastic works of art and music and businesses have been created by narcissists because it's our it's the greater glorification of our empire. And if you just happen to get dragged along and benefit from that, that's good for you too. It's been a, a real treat having you on the show, H.G. Tudor. Um, I, I, I can't wait to have you back uh, in a couple of months. Come back again. I know that uh, there's going to be a, a big uproar of questions that I'm going to get from this. I had friends of mine that say there's no way that you've got this guy on your show, <laughs> uh, which is a fair point as well. But at the same time, uh, when we revisit this as well, uh, I want to take this uh, into a, a second level because uh, I think we've just scratched the surface on the introduction of, of, of your work. Uh, yes. And I think really we could do an advanced class where people can really get to the distinctions once they start watching your videos, getting yes. a better understanding of the lessers, the mid ranges, the, the graders and the ultras, then you can have an advanced course as well. And I would love to facilitate that uh, for the people out there with your, with your tutelage of the hand. I'd be most delighted to come back again. Thank you for having me this time around and just let me know when you want to do that. I'll be pleased to talk further and uh, enhance people's understanding. Yes. And I appreciate you making the time this afternoon for you in Europe as well. Uh, this has been a different, uh, the first time we've ever done uh, Mental Health Monday on uh, 10 o'clock in the morning Eastern Standard Time as well. So uh, you're well, the Well, thank you for accommodating me with regard to your early yeah. start as well. So what you are, uh, it gives you, look at it this way, you, you've now got the rest of the day ahead of you to go and um, achieve what you want to achieve. So it's all good. Yes, and I can actually take my monkey suit off right now and enjoy my day versus like waiting for 7 o'clock tonight at our normal time. Uh, oh, I see. Well, surely with that hair, it's time for surfs up, dude, isn't it? Let's yeah, see. yeah, I think we're going to go hang 10 on, on, on Lake Huron today. So. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> she, it's been a slice. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. You're very uh, welcome. We will see you in a couple months. Okay, thank you. That's HG Tudor, ladies and gentlemen. Please, if you get the chance to go to his website, uh, narcsite.com. Uh, or you can go to his YouTube channels uh, under HG Tutor, Knowing the Narcissist, and on his Facebook page is Knowing the Narcissist as well. Um, I can tell you I've spent probably the last year or two um, listening to, I want to say 50 hours of HG Tutor, and it's been not only just more enlightening for me, but uh, I, I think for the people that I've referred his content to, uh, the difference and what he can do for you. Uh, I, I encourage you to reach out to him uh, and then we can have all the links here uh, where you can either take his NARC detector or your empath detector as well uh, and then be able to find uh, some peace of mind for you as well. So I wanna thank you for joining us early today on this Mental Health Monday. Uh, we had HG Tutor and uh, I'm overjoyed that uh, he, he joined us on the show today and gave us some insight to that. If you have any questions, feel, feel free to drop them in the box below and uh, have yourself a great week and we'll see you on next Mental Health Monday.